Welcome everybody, uh, both in the room and um, online. As you may have uh, seen in the invitation, we are streaming the event and we're also recording it. Um, my name is Inge Hussaiding and I'm the head of institute at the Institute of uh, Language, Culture and History at the University of Greenland, Elisabeth Dusafik. And um, I'm very happy to welcome you all here um, to uh, Anna Andersen, Dr. Anna Andersen's lecture, Resettlement of Indigenous Peoples in the Arctic, Case Study of the Sami People on the Kola Peninsula, Northwest of Russia. Anna is a Sami historian and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. She holds a PhD in history and an MA degree in indigenous studies, also from the University of Tromsø. Anna is a Kildin Sami researcher and historian, with her roots from a Sami family that was relocated from the Ashok area of the Kola Peninsula, eastern Sápmi. From 2010 to 2013, she conduct conducted her research in the Sami communities on the forced resettlements of her people from their traditional territories in the 1950s and 1960s. Later, from 2014 to 2019, Anna has studied the experiences of three generations of Sami who resided at boarding schools. Anna is currently residing here in Nuuk, where she is a visiting scholar here at Ilzimatus Afik, as a part of her work in the Tromsø-based research project Urban Transformations in a Warming Arctic. Um, that particular project is uh, collaborating with researchers here at Ilisima Dusafik and is also a part of uh, Ilisima Dusafik's Arctic Welfare Research Center. As a part of this project, Anna hopes to conduct an international study on relocations of the Sami and Greenlandic people in the 1950s and 60s. In this lecture, Anna will discuss her previous work and experiences, as well as her plans about research on how resettlement and urban development has been experienced in Greenland. She will share her experiences of being an indigenous person from a relocated family, about her work as an indigenous historian, and her motivation for doing historical research on resettlements in indigenous lands. Anna will also re uh, present the results of her research on relocations of the Sami people. By giving this public lecture, Anna invites the public discussion about invites to a public discussion about centralization policies that can lay a foundation for research together with Inuit communities and scholars as well. This lecture will be a starting point for her research here in Greenland on relocations that includes the analysis of archival materials and traditional indigenous storytelling about closed villages. After the, the lecture, there will be some time for comments and questions, and I will be moderating that as well. But uh, now I just want to leave the floor to you, Anna. So thank you. Go ahead. I think I will have to. Thank you very much, uh, Inge, for this very detailed introduction. And I welcome you all, and thank you for coming, and thank you. Uh, to all the rest who uh, are following online. Um, so as said, uh, I will mostly present the findings from my previous research and also outline a little bit uh, the plans uh, for my future research while I'm here uh, in uh, Nuuk, the University of Greenland. So we have someone coming. Hi, welcome. Um, well, but before I, I start, I think it is important to let you know that this session is recorded because uh, the field of studies that I'm working in is mostly the digital documentation of indigenous histories and all the discussions in this room, and that's why I really um, uh, uh, want you to engage uh, with any type of questions that you think are meaningful for uh, the topic of this research. Uh, because we have also a co-worker in the project who is making a, a, a protocol, a reference and minutes of the discussion after the lecture. Uh, and 
uh, this material with all of your questions and everything that we talk about in this room will be uh, apart from other interview materials and protocols from the meetings that I had in Greenland will be preserved in the uh, Greenlandic uh, National Archives. Uh, and this is to ensure that the data that um, we work um, with as researchers will be preserved in the National Greenlandic Archive so that the future Greenlandic scholars and students can have access and can do their own independent research on their own history. Uh, right, so let us start. Let me present my field of study. Uh, as a historian, I'm mostly working with the 20th century uh, history of the territory that is called Sapmi. Uh, and this is the uh, traditional territory uh, of uh, a big uh, number of Sami varieties uh, that, uh, encompassing different Sami, nine different Sami languages that st stretch across um, uh, the Kola Peninsula in Russia, uh, here, and all over Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And this is the territory that has, in the 19th century, been colonized between four different states. Uh, so the complexity of the uh, area of study uh, is very much predetermined by four state languages, uh, four different state political uh, movements and regimes, and also by four uh, different uh, majority cultures. So this is the mm, arena of um, the Sami existence. Uh, and I in this landscape, uh, I mostly do research about economic colonization in the 19th century and the 20th century uh, industrialization and urbanization of the Sami territories. Well, and mm, uh, if we narrow down, so uh, my field of study is the cultural history of the Kola Sami people. Uh, people that live, Sami people that live on, on the Kola Peninsula, on the Russian uh, side of the previously shown territory. And this is one of the most endangered Sami groups uh, with a total population of 1,599 people in 2010. So I presume that these statistics has changed um, in the previous 10 years. Um, maybe uh, the numbers can, might be slightly different today. And the Kola Peninsula is a uh, historical territory of four uh, different Eastern Sami languages, such as Akkala, Tier, Skolt, and Kildian. But today, only two of these languages are spoken, but are very critically endangered. And this is Skolt and Kildian. So we think that it's about 20 people who still can speak Skolt Sami, uh, in on the Kola Peninsula, and it's about 700 people that have different language uh, levels of language proficiency in Kildin Sami. Uh, and I am a Kildin Sami scholar and speak of the Kildin Sami language, which is the strongest among the others. But um, as peoples and as language varieties, we are protected by the UNESCO uh, Red List of Endangered Languages and Peoples. And uh, the reason I started to uh, my um, research with a uh, topic of resettlement of indigenous peoples is because I myself come from a relocated family uh, from the area that is called Arsjok. And here I will show you the pictures uh, of uh, the place where the village was situated in the past. Uh, and today, uh, and I find it very similar to Greenland, uh, today we visit our village only during the summer times. Uh, and as you see um, on uh, the, some of the pictures, there are no houses left. Houses were burned by the militaries, and that's why we have to do the camping trips. And when we come to this area, my family and other families, uh, that lived in this village uh, stay in summer for a couple of months and practice uh, fishing and traditional lifestyle uh, in this type of conditions. And also, uh, the topic of resettlements is deeply rooted, uh, I believe, in uh, Sami history. 
at least from uh, the part of the uh, people of the Kola Peninsula. And also just to, um, uh, for you just to be more familiar with um, my motivation um, on some interpersonal level. Um, I would like to present for you, now we will listen to a yoik. Uh, and this is the yoik of my grandmother. Uh, and this yoik is about village, Arsyok. And here you see the picture of the village and the camp and the old graveyards. So when we come uh, to our areas, it's extremely difficult to take care of the old uh, graveyards uh, that our ancestors are buried in. And here you see, I think it's a very meaningful picture, you see an older man who is trying to somehow uh, take care of the graves. And what is a uh, little history about this song? So I translated some of these words. Those who are Sami speakers here, they will understand a little bit more. But those who are non-Sami speakers, uh, I would like to pay your attention how, how she sings, what kind of words she use. And she, she says, nothing left, nothing was left, and no thing, single thing was left. And this is very interesting in Sami language. She says, the aliens. And the aliens doesn't mean that they are people from different planet. It's people from the same planet, but they are unknown. They are unknown, fremada. They are someone who we have no knowledge about. And they came and they turned out. And this is very special, because she uses this verb, kushka, um, to tear out uh, a plant, for example, or tear out a tree. Uh, and this is very interesting how it is reflected in indigenous language. Uh, when she says they tear out, like you tear out the roots of a plant with roots. And when you kushk, when you do it, you do it with pressure. You do not gently take out the roots and put it in a different soil. You cause pressure to pull it out. So that's how she sings about pulling out the village, the houses, sending away people, right? So now, a couple of minutes, I would like to present this yoik to you. Oh, God, oh. 
Oi, sorry. I've been up to do Yes, yes. Um, okay, so we did half of it. And uh, it is very important for me to say that um, this is a mm, traditional uh, way of singing. It's called the women's cry. And it's uh, very char characteristic for the Eastern Sami uh, part of the area. Uh, and uh, But let's us um, uh, continue. Um, so, uh, the displacement and uh, urbanization of indigenous uh, areas uh, is the whole epoch in the history of different indigenous peoples in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, this epoch started after the Second World War. Uh, and it happened not only with the Sami, but you can also see that it has happened all over the Siberia. Uh, it has happened in <laughs> Greenland, and if you see from the top, just from the top of the Earth, so you see that Sapmi is here. So this is actually the same hemisphere, which can be uh, explained by the why the developments were uh, uh, partially so similar. Uh, but also, uh, nevertheless, there was a huge and massive evacuation of the Sami uh, from the northern areas to the south of the country after the Second World War in Norway. Uh, in Russia, uh, it was something that was called the centralization policy. And now we already know that uh, this resettlement had a forced nature. And at the same historical period of the 1950s and 1960s, the policy of centralization was also introduced in Greenland. Uh, and displacement of many indigenous communities happened here as well, uh, exactly at the same time. Um, uh, so um, the, uh, I would like also to show you the map uh, that I have worked with in archives. It's a very old map uh, that we, with some graphic designers at the University of Tromsø, were able to restore. And these are the map of the Sami villages on the Kola Peninsula in the 1930s, before their war. And you see that all these red dots all over the peninsula, uh, they are uh, the original Sami villages. And this, with this like little bit white, uh, it's where my informants come from, the people I work with. But the uh, reason I show this map for you is to uh, compare it with the next map, which is from the 1950s. And here I always ask a question, do you see 10 differences? Um, Maybe I can help you. L let's look one more time at this one. We see that the Sami settlements, they are placed all over uh, the reindeer pastures here, uh, closer to the White Sea, and all over the uh, east, northeast coast, as well as a lot of the settlements. Uh, w this is the border to Finland and Norway, on the border to Finland and Norway. So when we look at the maps of the 1950s, we see that all these settlements from inland part, coastal part, and uh, border uh, transcending uh, areas are absent. And this, we'll see the landscape of the, please come in if you want. Um, the we see that landscape uh, of the settlements changes, that most of the settlements are uh, placed in the middle of the peninsula, where the big mountain chains are, and uh, with one capital, 
So it is very important to understand that all these settlements are the industrial Russian settlements that were built in the 1950s. Uh, these are known. Uh, these are no more the traditional Sami settlements uh, that we see on this map. So when I saw it as well, and I knew it from the history of my people and my family, I decided to have a look what has actually happened, where are the people, and uh, where are, what happened with these settlements, all of them, and where are the people. Uh, for now, I can just say that the people from all of this area here were resettled to one village in the middle of the peninsula. So this is what I was going to look at and I wanted to know um, how did it happen uh, and how, where did the people, uh, what happened with the people uh, as well. So then I decided that I will go and I will still interview those people who are still alive, who are still remember how they were resettled. Uh, uh, of course, I, I did uh, the studies of second li literatures, but also I did archive studies, and I went to archive and started to look at different governmental resolutions on closure of the villages, uh, any type of information like this regional maps and different uh, reference records. And I have to say uh, thank you very much to all of my informants who have also shared um, all of the materials from their private archives. So when I came to people and I started to talk with them, they started to show the pictures from their settlements. They started to, uh, many people collected different um, newspaper articles uh, about closure of their villages. So it helped uh, a lot. Uh, so uh, then when I went further, with my research, uh, I did, in the beginning, I did the statistical table, table three in my study, uh, and I identified that the third, from the period from 1930s to 70s, there were around 13 villages that were displaced uh, in this period, but po I possibly couldn't uh, have the capacity to look at uh, all of these villages, so I decided to choose three of them. And it also was predetermined by the fact that I found people from these three villages uh, with whom I talked and who shared their materials with me. Uh, so, of course, <laughs> now you understand why Ashtok would be the, 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 the first one, because I am personally connected to it, uh, but also because I was able to find more people from, from, from Ashtok area. And this is very important to say that um, uh, if you look at the map, I will show you on the map now. So this is Arsok, and this is Yovko, is the next one on my list. So this part of the peninsula is a heavily militarized area. Uh, the, all the northern fleets is here, ice-free base for at at atomic weapons and submarines, they're all based here. And this area was closed until uh, 2009. No foreigners can enter, and only we as indigenous peoples could enter and practice during the summertime, but still we were supposed to apply uh, and to go through a bureaucratic procedure, but now it's not, not, not any more uh, relevant. Now it's mm, free for us. Um, and here is the third one, uh, the village is uh, which is called Kardek, which is number three. Um, so this village was flooded uh, under the water uh, in, as a result of construction of the uh, hydropower electrostation, the cascade of uh, hydropower electrostation, uh, guess one and guess two. Uh, so, and this is not also um, um, accidental that I have chosen uh, these villages because they show us different reasons uh, why relocations happened. This is a military development. This is also uh, elimination on small, uh, uh, unpromising, economically unpromising uh, reindeer herding farms, and it is the industrial development and flooding uh, of um, uh, the village by the river dam. So I went down to these people and I would like to show you um, some of my informants, and I has been uh, very honored to work uh, with this person. Uh, who is at that point was one of the approximately two people who were the speaker of native speaker of the Ter Sami language. 
Um, so he has passed away, unfortunately. This woman from the Kardec said she also passed away. Um, here it is my informant in the middle. I think it's a very beautiful picture uh, from 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 uh, the childhood of my informants while they still lived uh, in their villages and a couple uh, where the husband is resettled from Osjork. And I thank these people, but also at the same time, uh, I feel that uh, this type of projects, they have a quality of urgent historical research because these people, they pass away every year. So when I did these interviews, uh, their stories are uh, w with me now, they are in archives, they are preserved. Uh, f if I would go back today, then a lot of people uh, were not there anymore. Um, so, um, and also I want to pay a special thanks to my co-worker in the project. Her name is Ganna, and she has done a big work on uh, helping me to get in touch with the most elders uh, in uh, the community. Uh, and we were able to do a very productive work. I thank you for all the time. Ganna, thank you very much if you see me. Um, well, but also what I say, um, the, mo the method I work is uh, very closely intertwined with what is called the oral history method. It is a biographical uh, study uh, with the use of semi-structured uh, interview um, uh, guides. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this different, the indigenous methods and oral history, at some points they do intertwine. But at some points it's very important to understand that even though we can also as indigenous scholars do the biographical studies, that's what we actually do, that's how we write history. Uh, indigenous methods in research, in my uh, view, is most and furthermost about what kind of perspectives are taken in narration of history, uh, from which standpoint the history is told. Uh, and m my perspective is that I uh, would like in my research, and I do it in my research, uh, um, I write history from the point of view of those people who are directly involved in their uh, historical or political movements and events, and also those people who are affected by it. Right, um, And when we speak about history and indigenous perspective, we have to understand that this is a historical narration in itself. But it's based, I ra rather say based, by in the worst case, it includes uh, the cultural understanding and practices, beliefs and values of indigenous communities. And by that, it moves to the societies, the world societies, closer to the social justice. Uh, uh, so this is um, uh, by far the most important in uh, indigenous historical narration, you can say, as a uh, as a method. But I'm working on this method myself very much. So, um, so w I believe what I do I is indigenous research, uh, mostly. Here, I would like just to show you more examples on uh, how on what kind of uh, photo materials I was uh, able to find. So this is the Yovkwe, this military closed area that was uh, resettled in 1963. And on this first picture, these are the pictures of uh, from private archives. On, on the first picture, uh, you're able to see how the uh, village looked like. So there was a fjord and this type of uh, wooden houses and the buildings. So when uh, uh, people uh, were resettled from this territory, they went further, uh, or at least they were supposed to go further, to a military close town which is called Grimika, and is also a, a military base uh, with submarines, and there they received housing instead of their houses. And you can see housing on the next picture barracks here. These were the barracks that were provided to the people uh, after um, they were resettled. Social housing. So this is one of the questions that I also, also heavily touch uh, in my work. And then we can go to Kordak. Uh, 
the village that was flooded under the water in 1965. Here we also see how the main street of the village, we see electricity. We know that there were medical points, we know that there were schools uh, in these places. Uh, we know that there was a cultural club, there was a cinema. So it was quite um, uh, a living village at that time. And here we see the place of the village right now. This is how it looks today on, uh, on this flooded part. So this village, it doesn't exist anymore physically, not even the space or the place of this village. Uh, but all those who were born and raised and lived in this village, they decided to build a memorial stone close to the area that was flooded. And this is very important because um, my informants also told me that the way that uh, we preserve the uh, graveyards for the ancestors, uh, so their ancestors were cemented so that the uh, bodies would not flow out during the flooding. So they are not able either to take care of the graves uh, of their ancestors. But uh, and that's why they made this memorial stone. It looks a little bit like a gravestone. But this is to preserve the knowledge that these people are uh, buried underwater. Okay? And then Arsjok was resettled the last in 1969. So we see as well one of the very old uh, pictures uh, by Hallström in uh, 16th century, 1670s. It existed from the 16th centuries, uh, but we have the first documentation, something like 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And we see here how the place for the village, so it was very also thought through how people settled, because here you have the open way to the sea, but here you have also drinking water from, from the lake. So, and also you have reindeer pastures and um, salmon fishing. So um, the areas were very much thought through where the people settled. And here uh, we see that it's, there are still a lot of reindeer there. It's very beautiful. And people visiting in this type of camps of course, with the Sami flag always. So, uh, and now, uh, as I already told, so one part from uh, the first village that I showed now, in, uh, closed in 63, they went to the closed military town where they received the barracks. But all other villages that were resettled, they went to the place, uh, one village, which was originally a Sami settlement um, before, uh, but um, here it is very important to understand that this place is called Luyavr, Luyavr in Northern Sami language, Lavusir in, in Russian, uh, and today it is portrayed as a capital of the Sami people. But um, this is very important to understand that this is an artificially created uh, Sami capital. It's not a capital, it is more like a reserve uh, for the Sami people that were uh, forcibly removed there. And what is important to understand, I want you to have a look at this picture. So this, uh, if you see here, you see the river. So this is originally a Sami settlement that is based along the river. Uh, and there are three nationalities that live uh, today in this settlement. One bank of the river was occupied in the uh, beginning of the 19th century by Kormi reindeer herders, is a different indigenous nation that migrated to the uh, Kula Peninsula, and now we already know that they bribed the police uh, to settle here, and they pushed away the Sami people from these areas to the banks of the river. So this village was already divided by the Sami reindeer herders and by the Kormis, who were in many conflicts. Be uh, because of these areas. This area, industrialized area of the city, was inhabited by Russians, of course, who came to build all these uh, infrastructures. And the people that were relocated from all those, at least in, in, in my research, 13 villages, maybe it was more, because I was able to find only 13, they received, uh, they received uh, this is boarding school. They received this part of the uh, house with old wooden buildings. And this uh, area was called the Little Paris. Maybe you can guess why. 
because there was a blast of social problems in the little Paris. Uh, and um, let's just go on. People from the flooded, uh, from the flooded village, they received one house, which is this type of five floors block house. Mm, but this house was only for uh, those who uh, were from the village that was flooded by gas. So this is sponsored by this company that flooded the village. Um, and the problem was um, the housing queue because all those people who would go to the places <laughs> that I call for, that everybody calls for Little Paris, and also people were staying at someone's friends' houses of relatives, uh, people they could know. Someone worked at the stalls, for example, and lived at the stalls. So this, the people were supposed to receive housing uh, when their place in the queue was due. Uh, and according to uh, the interview research that I did, many people waited for up to six, eight years, and many people have unfortunately passed away b before uh, their uh, place in the queue was uh, due. And one of the very important um, a document that uh, was also uh, found by me during the, my field work is the lists of the people that were resettled from uh, for example, Arstok village, and there were people uh, who were relocated. When they were relocated, they counted people. And what is more important, with this red, here they wrote the mortality reasons for the relocated people. So here we can see with all that those who have plus, these were people who are still alive uh, at the moment. Uh, when the uh, resettlement was um, uh, already implemented, the resettlement was implemented. So here we see different reasons. It, it gives such much data, because here we see frozen in the street, tuberculosis, uh, shot himself, uh, burned, drowned, burned, a lot of tuberculosis here, drowned, froze. Uh, and so on. So it's all together on this list. Here we also see some pluses. So when I counted the number of pluses, I realized here we see it was 130 people resettled and 13 pluses we see at the moment when they filled out the lists. So we can say that only 10% of the population of this village has survived uh, after uh, their removal. And we also see all the mortality reasons, uh, which are uh, by an, uh, the other scholars that did uh, similar research in this area. Uh, uh, it is documented that uh, it is called the death according to the on um, external reasons. So um, the academic from Moscow, his name is Andrei Kozlov. He has done a very good study, a statistical study. And here I preserve his formatting uh, in his book, um, where he says the word negative was too soft to describe the situation of the population, where at a very high mortality rate, half, he writes with the big letters, of all deaths are drowning, poisoning, homicide, and suicide. And then let us just return to his statistical table that I uh, very often use to demonstrate in numbers, uh, the effects of resettlement. So here we see that what they did in their study, we know that the last, uh, we know that the last village was relocated in 1969. So what he does, he does this percentages of mortality and general per year, external reasons, and he compares it with the majority population. And here we see that uh, if we start from 1958, so uh, mortality was uh, something from 0.31 to 16. When we go to 1968, I showed you that the last village was resettled in 1968. We see it doubles. Uh, I don't know why this is like that, but here we see these are the decade after. 
So one thing is you when you remove people and place them, but another thing is the decades of adaptation after the resettlement. So we see that the numbers would be very high, especially in the second decade. So first five years, second five years. Then the people started to pass away. And then it kind of comes down uh, a little bit. Here is also uh, high mortality, but here we know that this is the economic crisis of the 1990s in this country. So it has not to do, nothing to do with resettlements. And also what is important, that out of these very big mortality numbers, we see that uh, half of them are the external reasons. Um, all right. So the the main um, rationale <laughs> of the centralization policies in this case was that the small Sami villages uh, are too difficult to subsidize. Uh, that they have uh, you have to subsidize reindeer herding farms, you have to subsidize electricity, you have to subsidize schools, medical points. Uh, so um, the background of the policy was that if you would just put all the sm small people into one place and build one infrastructure, so it would be much cheaper, much cheaper. Uh, then it was decided that the, all the small villages were proclaimed economically unpromising, uh, unpromising of further investments, and they uh, were supposed to be closed. So it is a um, very banal reason for, for this, this is just cheaper to uh, put people uh, in, in these conditions than to subsidize all infrastructures. But on the other hand, something that I look very closely through the interview materials is that in many of the written documents that I worked with, um, uh, it was stated that the people wanted to move, they wanted to uh, have development, uh, that they requested uh, to be um, placed into the urban environment. And here it's very handy uh, with doing uh, especially interview research and research in this perspective that I use. Uh, because uh, when I started to talk with some of the elders, I realized that it was not that simple. For example, I just show you some examples. Uh, when the woman that she was present uh, at the meeting, uh, where the authorities would come and announce that uh, they have decided to close the village. And uh, this woman, when she was in the meeting, she didn't even understand what, what was going on. And then when she talks to me, she says, they gathered a meeting, and then, do you know what they did? They acted as if we ourselves requested to come here to, to, to reserve. They said that people say that we wanted to come here, which was very cunningly done. So some informants, they um, didn't speak a, let's say, colonial language. Uh, well, they don't even, they didn't even understand what was happening during the meetings. And they, of course, didn't understand that they were supposed to uh, move somewhere. Uh, so some informers, they really felt that it was unjust, and they felt that they were cheated uh, in, in this way. Uh, th and they know that these meetings were going on. They had uh, no idea what was uh, kind of decision we were taken in these meetings. Okay. So others say that no one asked the people. The, everywhere went where they could. There was the resolution of the government, so it should be executed. That's what they understood from the meetings. Everything was liquidated or sold in the villages. So the medical points liquidated, uh, or, or the schools, uh, the shops, uh, everything. And she said, uh, she is a woman. Uh, she said that the reindeer herders, they left immediately because they didn't have anything to be occupied with and no work and no farm because they also closed the reindeer herding farms and people were very dependent on uh, reindeer herding farms and uh, and also fishing farms in, in these villages. Uh, the other people remember in very detail how uh, the resettlement has happened and I really like this third story. Uh, the woman remembers how people arrived on tractors and they told them to load their things and that's it. And there was an order 
that was given and they arrived and they loaded us like sheep she says and that's it they took us they resettled us and they didn't ask much and I wonder how we managed to go then with such a heavy load on the river and we didn't fall through the ice we were going in winter with tractors along the river so it's very I think valuable information on uh, the way uh, that the resettlements were implemented uh, from the memories of the people involved to that and also uh, such details that they were going with tractors the whole village al uh, on the ice um, also some security questions that are present in these memories and of course I have to say that uh, even though I do uh, my research in the framework of indigenous perspective uh, I would argue with those who <laughs> could argue with me that I um, follow any special agenda because I work with different types of people uh, and those people within the co indigenous communities that also have different opinions. And here I would like to demonstrate that, uh, for example, the first informant, uh, she said that it was already very difficult to live a nomadic life at that time, that the world started to develop and the life started to change. And that's why so many people, they understood that uh, life will change at some point. Uh, and she says, of course, in these apartments it's so good, you have the electricity and you don't have to bring water, um, and you have here cold and hot water. Um, so they acknowledge the benefits of, uh, of the comfort. Uh, and But if you look at the another informant, she says, yes, of course the apartment is comfortable. Uh, but it was fun to live in, in the village. Yeah? Even it was a lot of work. I do feel that I was good. I had a uh, good life there, because I do not mind bringing water, or bringing wood. Right? It, it was better at home. You still uh, uh, live as you want to live in your home. So some people also thought that it is okay for them to bring water. I mean, it's not a big deal. Uh, it's not a big deal to heat and may chop wood. Hmm? So. Mm, there cannot be a unified opinion, uh, but uh, facts uh, are facts. Okay, so another perspective that I really started to move forward in this um, in this uh, work that I do is that I started through the lines of uh, these uh, stories see the impacts which are not even the already a social impacts. It's not about the uh, settlement structures. Uh, it's a, 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 a very, very um, personal impact, uh, not a collective impact, as I say, as a personal impact on the people's health and well-being. For example, this is a story of a woman who was born in Kardec uh, uh, and resettled in 1956. And she, after the resettlement, when the, the um, uh, village was flooded, she tried to go back by boat and looked what has happened with the village right after the resettlement. And she describes what she has saw. And she said it was all flooded and houses are gone and there was nothing. It's, it is all blown out. And it's very important when the informants tell these stories, they recreate their memories and that's why they always tell it in the present and it is very important to understand that these people they still experience what they have experienced in the past uh, and they even say it in present tense as you see it is flooded houses are gone there is nothing it is all blown up by water all the houses are turned upside down so she saw the houses floating the cemetery is flooded but now when there I turned half back way and she was experiencing a heart attack so she was evacuated back because she says it was the first time I went but I live there and I work there and now there are only trees rotten trees and planks, everything is floating all over the place. And here you see a floating window or a door. It is a nightmare. So, but we are researchers and we know that when people uh, recreate uh, their very stressful memories, uh, they speak in a, um, present tense because um, 
this is the part of uh, their being, what they have experienced. And also in this situation, she experienced so much stress that she started to have the increased blood pressure. Uh, and this is also, uh, we know that this is um, one of the symptoms of the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, so that's why I also turn in my studies, I think I will be coming up to that, to a more, let's say, advanced theory, uh, uh, which is uh, done by the American post-colonial psychologist. Uh, and they, s they also say that there is an impact, not only on the collective, because all these experiences there in the, fl in the first place, they are part of the collective historical memory of the peoples. They are there, they are not disappearing, they live on its own rule. And they create some, uh, uh, something that is the phenomenon that is called the social pain. And it's also a collective phenomena, which is transmitted from one generation to another in forms of memories, stories, and experiences. And it doesn't vanish. It doesn't vanish in the next few generations. Uh, and we know that these people who experienced these policies, they had clear post-traumatic uh, effects, but they, th there was no any follow-up. There were no any uh, psychological follow-ups or consultations or nothing. So that's why people had to cope with this stress on their own. And it has given a whole blast uh, of very problematic social consequences in relation to mental and physical health, but also in relation to um, you know, social problems in, in, in the communities. Uh, those who understand me, they understand me and will not go directly into what kind of social problems we face. But everybody knows, all right? So now <laughs> I want to um, say to you that why I'm here, because I want to know how resettlements and the centralization policies were implemented in Greenland, and particularly in New Carrier, because we are kind of, from our project, we are bounded to this area. It would be great to look at the north and east uh, in the future. But I want to know how it happened and how the policy was implemented. And then I want to look at the impacts, actually, and I want to look at the impacts uh, on the more comparative scale between the Sami and the Greenlanders. And of course, I will like to theorize what is the role of the epoch of industrialization, urbanization, and resettlement in development of indigenous peoples and in our history as well. Um, so that's why I looked a little bit on what happened in the Nook area. And I realized that uh, in, in the uh, centralization years, there were nine settlements that were closed only in New York area. And it totally, from the 50s to 2000s, there were 12 settlements. And we see that the uh, tendency is quite low in New York area, for example, in modern times, but it's still there. It still exists. While the biggest change, of course, has happened with all that people from nine different settlements. So what am I also um, very much engaged in now is to uh, have this type of talks, let people know that I am here, uh, that I am ready uh, to talk with everyone who knows someone who has experienced resettlements, and I say to you and to all those who listen and watch me online now, uh, and if you think that this type of research is important, so I encourage you to tell your story, to be my guide in Greenland, uh, to to volunteer to get in contact with uh, me or Stan Jepsen, could you please raise? I want to introduce you. Uh, everybody knows maybe that Stan is w working in Urbtrans as well now and he is helping uh, uh, in communication with people 
um, or it is always the opportunity to just talk to me in private. This is also very important. So please spread the word uh, for those people who think that is important. Uh, I am here and here you see my phone number. I have no Greenlandic number, but Stan has a Greenlandic number. Everybody who is in the room or who is there on streaming, uh, there is an opportunity to always get in touch with us uh, and uh, talk, make an interview or maybe no interview, whatever you want or wish. Yes? Uh, so I believe I will leave it. Do I have anything more to say? No, nah, no. It's just... Um, so now I am very open to any questions that you have, any comments. Uh, maybe we can take a, a round. Uh, and I have to say also all, to all those people who are on streaming now, I really appreciate that you uh, watch um, this lecture, but I want to say that th uh, there is a shortcoming of technology on the part. I know that it's so cozy in your living room on the sofa right now, but the <laughs> the on the other hand, uh, coming personally to such events will give you the opportunity to ask questions. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, uh, I cannot answer the questions of people who are watching online, only, only, only those who are in the room right now. Mm. Thank you very much, Anna, also for the presentation and for your grandmother's joik, which I've now had the pleasure of hearing twice, uh, since Anna was also giving a lecture, a very nice lecture, public lecture at the Nuk Nutora Local Museum just a few weeks ago. So um, any questions or comments from the audience? Javier, I think I will move with this one because I don't trust the other microphone, sorry. Oh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, th I found it very interesting, and I was just wondering about your comparison with Greenland on the uh, resettlement policies. I, uh, in Greenland, there was a paradoxical development here that uh, statistics show that in Greenland, um, child mortality and life expectancy increased during the relocation mm -hmm. period, which is opposite or somewhat uh, different from that experience that you that you mentioned. However, I think the avenue that in order to compare it is not to focus on the macro statistics, but on the oral histories uh, that, that uh, your um, interviewees uh, uh, have to tell you. And I think that's where it is going to be rich, that comparison of, of Greenland and, and, and this location. So, um, I, I was just wondering whether uh, you're going to um, raise that there are some parallelisms, but at the same time, there are some um, contradictions. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, uh, can I, if I just comment on the baby boom, let's say in Greenland, uh, of course, the, the factors is also we don't know um, uh, how much uh, in. Um, uh, how much uh, reset settlement of n the white people was in this uh, Sami village during the time, because there were only Sami people who were resettled there uh, for these years. Um, and there is no probably ability of too much intercourse <laughs> um, during this time. But we know in Denmark there were a lot of workers and labor workers were coming, and the country was opening up af after 1950s, right? It was closed for a long time. Uh, so there are certain factors that uh, are different and that also can explain the uh, difference in um, these types of results. Uh, other, uh, on the other hand, we don't have we have the birth statistics, but we don't have mortality statistics either during this time. So there are many interesting parallels, as you say, that might seem as a contradiction, and may maybe they are not in the end. So um, of course uh, uh, we will be aware about all these different nuances, uh, but of course it's not only the differences, or not only similarities, but also differences that would be highlighted that are interesting to look through. Uh, like this is a, a difference, but it, it also can be explained by different factors uh, that are actually a part of Greenland's history as well, if we speak about this uh, side. Uh, so of course, of course, it will not only be um, 
one process, it will not be one-sided. And description of facts and events, yeah. Any other questions or comments? I might have one, if no one else. Yeah, please. Um, talking about the comparisons as well, I think it's safe to say that the post-war uh, period in Greenland was the most massive uh, policy-driven uh, assimilation phase in the colonial history of Greenland. And this was about housing and schooling and a lot of changes mm -hmm. that changed the culture quite fast. Um, how was that in on the Kola Peninsula? What happened? You say people were rehoused or resettled in, in housing that was different. And of course, they were taken away from the place where they had always mm -hmm. lived. But, but did other things change? How did the... No children have to learn a other yeah. language, did they have to go to school and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there, there is also post-war period, there's uh, things that happen at the same time and now I think I'm smart that I included this. <laughs> so I have written a PhD uh, about uh, the same historical period because I started my work with resettlements and then I realized that there's not only resettlements happening at the same time. So, of course, the people who were resettled, primarily their children would be placed at the boarding school because there were so much housing problems. So, uh, the boarding schools of this uh, post-displacement uh, post uh, period in World War II, uh, they are very much schooling policies and housing policies and resettlement policies, they're very intertwined. Uh, so, why, why cannot say that it happened only this, because now it's topic, if you allow me, I can make a lecture about uh, boarding schools as well, but it's a long story as well, it will take time. So also several policies, um, because all the, most of the countries that had indigenous minorities after the war uh, would strengthen their national policies because uh, of the risk of uh, the post-war enemy would come and you know, no one wanted to do to have any more wars, and that's why it was in most places of the world it was decided to make uh, indigenous peoples into something else. And I can talk about it as well because it was exactly this rearing the new industrial man policy uh, that was very complex. It was also, by the way, not only education but also uh, fishing fabrics and reindeer herding fabrics and and accustoming indigenous peoples to the working clock uh, of a European man. This also happened. Uh, so it's industry, military plans, schools, uh, uh, displacements, it's all intertwined. Um, so um, I hope that, uh, but at this point, I think it's very good to separate it by blocks it will give a better detailed view into one and then like we as a historian will work like you know milestone stones uh, and I have to say that this part of indigenous history is researched but not everywhere in the world right we know there is a lot of in the US and Canada that is written but in the some areas that is not much written about it in Greenlandic part of the world is uh, very little that is written from this perspective so um, so it's a lot of work that's going to try to say, because it's a big, uh, big slice of uh, both in the number of policies, uh, but also at, in a timeline. Uh, it's like uh, you can speak at least from the end of 80s. Uh, so it's a big slice of time and there are a lot of policies. Uh, yeah, but it, it's possible, it's possible. It's just to, to work harder, <laughs> work more. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions or comments? Maybe we can finish with the, the realization that we had when you did your, the, uh, you remember the map with, uh, with Greenland on top of the world? Yeah. yeah. Because it's the thing when you talk about comparison, we never really thought about these uh, parallel Cold War stories on either side of the Iron Curtain, at least I didn't, and I'm even a historian, but uh, you were talking about the relocations on Kola, and I wasn't, I didn't know much about it, but of course I knew about the naval base at Murmansk, and this was one of the main causes of a lot of the resettlement, so 
um, relocations. And then I was realizing when you were talking about it that one of the most, well, I say, well-known uh, relocations in Greenland were the two layer base um, with the with the people from Uman not being moved, uh, like in a very uh, abrupt relocation. And this was going on, like just here and there, about the same time on either side of the Iron Curtain. And uh, even though you have this historical knowledge and you really know it, it wasn't until you were talking about it that we yeah. we were thinking, well. Um, yeah, because we can see that uh, right, Greenland is just over the col like across the Kolok Peninsula, and here we have NATO bases, and here we have Russian bases. So it is also very uh, important to see how the role of indigenous peoples in these geopolitical conflicts. And it right. was just all of a sudden, it just seemed um, clear. very clear that mm. um, yeah. that the the, the the Arctic in the post-war years, well. Even though it was very different policies at a glance, some of the effects mm -hmm. were immediately the same. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting. There was two big powers, there are a lot of uh, like intertwining consequences for us uh, people, I mean. And the thing is that uh, we used to look at the uh, planet from the equator, and we think around the equator. But when we look, and the Earth from the top, a totally different perspective to open up. It is actually view from the top. Then you start thinking differently uh, about things. And it is also interesting, this discussion, I think, how we challenge the, uh, you know, the world view in a way, mm. that you can actually look at the planet from different sides, not just a linear <laughs> view from equator. Right. Well, if you look at it in a Danish American slash Russian perspective, uh, they, those stories are not intertwined. But if you yeah. look at it in a, the, it's a quite historical a perspective, those stories are connected. Absolutely. Yeah. So Western thinking is very linear, mm -hmm. uh, equator thinking, and it misses some of the very important nuances, mm -hmm. uh, at least in this hemisphere. That helped. We just had to start <laughs> having a conversation, <laughs> just blabbering away. Uh, Ebe and then uh, Vivi. Yeah, is it on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for an inspiring lecture. I wonder if I may ask a little more general or slash or personal question, having the rare opportunity to speak mm -hmm. to a. Uh, killed in Sami speaker in Tromsø. Uh, so I wonder if you might uh, give us um, a little impression of how that is to be from one part of Sami and living in another part of Sami. For instance, when it comes to languages, I mean, I know you have quite big differences between the dialects, but how are you communicating within the uh, the uh, Sisami um, community in Tromsø, and how is there a sense of community, or are there other kind of uh, yeah boundaries? Or, yeah, I, I think yeah, you know I what, I, <laughs> what I mean. Yeah, I thanks. can answer that um, just right away. Uh, well, it is um, well you what you call for position of a minority inside of a minority. Uh, because the Sami are the minority in uh, all of the four countries, and we are very endangered little minority within this collective, actually. So, of course, it is a special position on that part uh, uh, that differs from um, maybe Sami who live in their own areas with surrounded by majority language, uh, but not all the Sami live like that today either. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is a special position. You are kind of still at the, uh, one one hand in double pressure. Uh, on the other hand, um, um, what was it? Not you said. Ah, how do you communicate? On the other hand, you know, I also see those intergenerational differences because uh, the more assimilation presses on us, the, the more other languages we start to use, like English, like. Uh, Norwegian or uh, any other languages, but if you look back into generations of my uh, father and my grandmother, 
people didn't know so much good English. It's very interesting to look at that. Uh, and then people communicated in Sami because they didn't have a choice. <laughs> and they were, you know, pretty well because I still have people from the other dialects that I speak my language and they speak their language, but we know each other for many, many years and they are accustomed to that. They, they are used to hear my speech. Uh, but when you start talking to a younger, we are getting a little bit lazy, I think, with this assimilation. We just switch to another because we want her to have a personal connection. Uh, but I still have some young people with, uh, um, within the families that I grew up together with in northern, northern Sami areas that totally understand me and understand them, but it's just a matter of being used to do that. Um, and in work, it you know, takes time. So that's why we kind of start shifting now to all those possible languages. But what I can say that I think it's life in Sapmi is very exciting on the part that now we have accommodated all those languages. We can have the same company who would like, you know, you don't hire one language or another. And it's totally okay for us. We are not afraid of uh, this um, also diversity. Actually, we're used to that. This is just, oh, I think Vivi, maybe you have a question, but I think it's like that in Greenland as well. You have East Greenland and you have North Greenland and you have West. And for example, for us, it doesn't matter what language we speak, as if, as long as we are together, uh, it's the main kind of uh, communication has become more qualitative, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. It was, for me as an indigenous, also is it was amazing to see another perspective from so many, actually for me, so many similarities from here. Um, and as Inge said, the centralization here was massive uh, and, and there were so many things that was ongoing back then and actually think the mortality came very later now, actually, and, 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 and in, in, in other words, in other forms. Mm. So my question is, mm. yeah. how do you f like experience the consequences mm -hmm. of post-colonial? Yeah. I don't think it's post, but either way, how is it affecting the people now? Mm. In which way? I know the similarities are very much alike, yeah. and and um, I just want to acknowledge your presentation. Yeah. I hope many talk to you here, because yeah. we need this kind of research much more here. So thank you. Thank you, because, uh, and that's why I always say, people who talk, talk to me, they talk to me, but they also talk to Greenlandic National Archives. So this is very important. We do it to preserve it for this people, for your people. I'm just an instrument. I'm just a tool. That's how I see my role. Uh, but about uh, consequences, just very briefly, I say what I came to in my work. And I think it's still. Um, this is something that has cut off the, the peoples from their ancestral lands. And there's something, at least in our area, that has, in a way, made the access to fishing and ray herding so difficult that the people were supposed to emerge in the other types of professions, like engineer or office worker or uh, anything else, or maybe practicing fishing and hunting just sometimes. So it and it has created a shift, uh, a different point of view on what is reindeer herding. It's no more a lifestyle. What is fishing? It's not or, or hunting. It's no more the lifestyle, uh, because the people they were um, employed uh, at the farm to do that. So it's more industrial activity. It has lost its cultural sense in many ways, and also because children were brought up in the nature by uh, doing traditional economic activities. So the whole fault view has um, changed on that part that people had to work as a labor workers instead of uh, practicing the lifestyle. Uh, 
Of course, there was a lot of economic losses, like, such as houses and jobs and well-being that are very difficult to overcome through one generation. If you have lost your house, if you have lost everything that you owned, uh, and at the same time, you don't have a job as a fisher or a hunter, and you don't have a formal education like in the Western world, it's very difficult to come back economically to to uh, uh, a good life. So economic losses uh, and homelessness uh, and of course um, employment was a big problem because the traditional fishers, gatherers, hunters and reindeer hunters, they, they simply couldn't get the formal higher education overnight. And resettlement happened very fast. So this moment was not thought through at all. As I said, financial losses. And it's difficult. It's not like, you know, you can, uh, I don't know, we, well, how would you earn this money back? Now, of course, and many people, they were um, a lot in grief and in depression. So you need also emotional capacity, not only economic capacity. You need emotional capacity to start your life all over again in totally different circumstances. It's not that easy. And some people also language problems uh, can play a role. And uh, for example, case with the summit was that when the reindeer herders were removed to this village, um, there was a reindeer herding farm there, but all the working places were already occupied by the local herders. So the more working places were not created. And they were not able to integrate in this world just like overnight. Uh, and, and reindeer herder was a respected profession uh, in this community. And then suddenly you wake up without no status at all. So it, it is a whole bulk of things that cannot be resolved uh, through even one generation. It takes time. So every new generation has to start all over again. Um, it's about consequences, Vivi, I wanted to say. So I speak about this in... Um, a more <laughs> popular scientific way, but you can always read my work and it's so very scientifically argumented for these things, as you see, as well. Mm. So this complex issue. Oh, sorry, can I also say about Vivi, because I said this is what is most difficult for me right now, is also to trace, you know, because this is already a work that has been to be done after. Now we are just at the stage where we try to find out what has happened and how. And then we can move on. So it takes a lot of work to more work and more work. And that's why we say, guys, please work. <laughs> because we, we need more people in the, on this boat. Because uh, um, now we are at the stage where we know what happened. But then we have to move forward do more work and see how it, how we can mitigate, how we can remove the consequences or make it a little bit better. I have a little uh, comment uh, about your presentation. I think your presentation is very uh, relevant also to, this, to the situation we have in Greenland today and also very uh, valuable on this information because you know that Greenland still have a, a spread population with many villages or bukta in, in Greenland. I know for the politicians in Greenland it's very taboo when uh, people or politicians politician began to talk about closing uh, the villages, the bukta in Greenland and so on because then the thoughts about uh, the concentration policy suddenly will appear and, uh, and, and so on because they are afraid to uh, uh, repeat the history the last from the 50s and 60s. So I think it's, it will still be quite relevant in the future about the spread uh, population we have in Greenland and especially uh, they talk about is it the, can you afford to have so much, so, such a spread population with the uh, with shipping and other things too. So I think uh, just comment that the, this kind of research will be very valuable and we can learn, learn from the past. So yeah. we'll see in the coming future mm -hmm. at other places too what, what 
what will the best solution be about such kind of things, or shall we keep the spread population or not, or, yeah. or find other ways? Uh, so that it's uh, it's it's very interesting. Mm. Thanks for a good presentation. Thank you very much, Stan, for your comment because this is exactly why we historians actually do our work. We go back uh, into historical events. We look at them in detail, we revise them, we see what kind of techniques, what has been done uh, that benefited, what didn't work, how things should be done, how policy should be drafted. And uh, speaking about you know, resettlement policies as indigenous peoples, we are very much afraid of history repeating itself all the time. So this is also a work that uh, I hope can, uh, one of the impacts of this work is to uh, draft on what are the peaceful ways, what are the better ways, what should be revised, what should be put into attention to if it's going to happen again, right? That's why we speak about these impacts and that's why we speak about um, the consequences because um, it can as well be used. Um, uh, these experiences of the past, they can always be revised and they always can be found a solution, I hope. Uh, a, a better solution in case there is no other choice, uh, at least. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm. um, firstly, thank you, Anna. It's, it's always amazing to hear you speak and I learn something new every time. Um, I'm just really curious about how in the broader society, maybe within Mamansk or the Kola Peninsula, these histories are taught, if they're taught within the schooling system mm -hmm. and the ways in which they're kind of framed as the kind of the discourse of that area. Because I know within the context I come from, mm -hmm. in within Australia, it's, it's something that is incredibly difficult to do well, and I'd be very curious about what, what happens in Russia. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Prashanti, for your question. I think it's not only in Russia. I think it's m many of the nation states with big numbers of indigenous peoples. It's always a struggle to include uh, what we call the other version of the history in uh, curricula or in a compulsory part of the educational um, content in any institutions. Uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, uh, in uh, in Russia, it's not a big part of the um, school system, and especially also here we have to think as well because these are very sensitive uh, stories that may be not for children in the beginning. Uh, that maybe they are good where they are at the university level right now, uh, but it takes a lot of resources to uh, write these special curricula. Uh, and I know there were some initiatives in Canada, for example, where they, uh, the whole groups of, of scholars worked for elaboration of such curricula. So it is a very complex issue. Uh, you always need not only just the financial, but also human resources. And it's time when we had a strong leadership, uh, <laughs> surprisingly, but it was Soviet Union. Uh, there were research groups for the Sami language that did a huge work on to do to trying to introduce the Sami language and the parts of the Sami history uh, in the uh, school curricula. Um, for now, this work kind of, but it's al always dependent on this group of enthusiasts, almost all the time. Just it's it's not that the Ministry of Education would request it. It's very rarely. Not any country that I know have ever requested this. It has always been driven by the indigenous peoples themselves. Yeah. So um, for now, these uh, old research groups are already pensioned. So just to wait for maybe new, new uh, young scholars, army uh, scholars who would also uh, unite their efforts. But uh, but it's a very complex issue. It's not. Uh, it's not easy. It, I th I believe if someone would really work with it, then it might be possible, and then these people could tell more about it. Uh, inclusion of Sami content in schools is a big deal in Norway as well. So it's almost a political uh, case as well. So I don't think it's impossible, but uh, it is a whole other cluster of work that has been to be done by uh, indigenous organizations and institutions and the professionals 
it takes much more than just like one or two persons. We still have time, so yeah. And I get some exercise. So, I want to I want to thank you uh, for the presentation. I've, I knew nothing about these relo the, the relocation, the resettlements on the Murmansk on the Kola Peninsula, and so that was very informative. And also, you got me thinking um, when you described the situation in Lovazero with the different with the Sami and this other indigenous group that were sort of thrust together. Um, it got me thinking about, so my background is from, from Northern Canada, and there are so many cases of resettlements um, there where different indigenous groups were sort of placed in the same sort of reservation type of system. Uh, and it created not only sort of these individual type of traumas that, that seems to be your focus, but it created group-based tensions mm -hmm. that continue decades later to sort of resonate in modern indigenous politics. And so many of the sort of uh, conflicts that you see in some of these indigenous communities or even in the larger indigenous regions like Nunavut, for example, are... Um, they're sort of the echoes of these relocations where two groups have been thrust together on territory where there you know one was came in later or, or or they were conflicting over sort of shared resources like you were saying about the group coming and not having you know uh, reindeer grazing territory left but it but it struck me i mean perhaps this that issue has been um given scholarly attention but i just started thinking about all the instances uh, uh, where this has created tensions within indigenous politics, mm -hmm. you know, setting group against group. So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, mm, I, I thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, but it also depends on how the process, uh, if we say, <laughs> uh, I believe one one thing which you put two groups in one area and other thing is you put three thirteen villages in one area. So it might also make a difference on, on, on the cause of the tensions. Uh, and of course it has been tensions between those who came and those who were. Uh, but it has, um, you know, it has been a formative share, shared experience for the whole group. Um, uh, and you know, I am relocated. You are relocated. He's relocated. Everybody is somehow relocated from somewhere. So, uh, in this sense, it was more. <laughs> you can say that the people I'm intermixed uh, with each other, as well. Inter, and it was. Um, I say it was not the tribal structure in the beginning. We have to say there were different villages, but the Sami communicated with each other, and there were intermarriages, and there were no boundaries like you cannot come here and I cannot come here. Um, so, um, the Sami has always built quite peaceful tribes on that part. And uh, sometimes even uh, welcome to newcomers. Some Sami villages had Norwegian population and Finnish population in them. So, there were Norwegian and Finnish settlers across the Kola coast that the Sami uh, villages accommodated. Uh, so, uh, so far, um, it's of opposite effect on that the people are intermixed now uh, very much between uh, different tri tribes, you can say, or different varieties, uh, which form uh, today's Sami community, or today's Sami uh, collective, you can say. Um, so this is the result of uh, this intermixture between different Sami varieties and different peoples. So this is more the result, and I know in Greenland it's something was well interesting to see. People are also into make someone from one village and someone from another, and they are in the marriage and then they have mixed children. So it's more that um, uh, the cultural mixture is uh, the result in this case, rather than oppositional conflicts you know, between different groups. So these groups, they still identify themselves. For example, I say I'm Arsyok Sami, though I'm not lived there. And it, it exists only in my consciousness, let's say, or when I go there. Uh, but we differentiate ourselves still under these terms. But um, everybody quite intermixed, and this is a small community as well. Uh, so it, it might be the opposite effect that people got more closer to each other on that part.
because it's a shared formative experience for most, except from one village, right? And even those who were from this original village, many of them married newcomers. So this is also part of their formative experience indirectly. For example, I am married to a man who was resettled. But they are already a part of their family history. So uh, it's more like a common shared experience right now, uh, rather than it can uh, cause the conflicts or struggles on that part. It, no one has... <laughs> No one has resources equally. You know, everybody is poor, so there is nothing to uh, to go into conflict with each other about kind of this mentality. Everybody was equally poor after that. So, mm. yeah. Last chance for a final question or comment. And thank you for for those questions and comments that we did get. It was very nice that so many of you engaged in this. And thank you, Anna, thank for you your much. presentation. And you're you're here for a while yet? Yes. Until June. Early yeah, June. Yeah, I'm here until June. Yes. And Anna resides on the top floor of the building, uh, third floor, where you can drop by. But um, as far as I know, right now you spend most of your days in the archives. Yes, uh, it's much better to write me an email yeah. uh, and if someone wants to have a conversation with me and all those who listen to us and follow us by into please take contact with me or Stan yeah, and also if you want to speak about resettlement that's also an important part of the w me being here and thank, thank you very much everybody all for your questions, thank you thank you